decade ago, delegates from around the world descended on Bonn for the 20,000 installment of the annual UN Climate Conference, COP23. Two years after the signing of the Paris Agreement, COP23 looked to build on this baseline. Our panel tonight will discuss what was achieved over the past two weeks. We will also explore the state of the international climate process as a whole in achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement and ultimately to limit climate change to one and a half degrees. I'm delighted today to introduce our speakers this evening. Unfortunately, Dr. Alina Avachenkova, who was due to be with us, has fallen to the cop cold, which you may also be able to hear in my voice. Um, the somewhat inevitable consequence of a couple of weeks in poorly ventilated halls at COP. However, we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Salim Hook, the director of the International Centre for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh, um, and also uh, lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change on Adaptation and Mitigation. We're also joined by Professor Miles Allen, the senior member of our society, um, who is also a professor of geosystem science in the School of Geography and the Environment and the head of the Climate Dynamics Group in the University's Department of Physics. And he's also been an IPCC lead author for going on two decades. Anyway, uh, no more from me. Um, I will now hand over to my two uh, much more capable uh, panelists this evening. So if you could give them a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Who's first? Um, so, so I'll, I'll, I think the, the, main, the main event here is Salim uh, because he's the one who's really uh, engaged with the whole UNFCCC process. So I will warm up back, so I just I, I make the jokes to start with. Um, so, uh, but I just wanted. So I, I was in. I was actually involved in a seminar in the physics department there, um, and they, they originally invited me um, a, a while ago, and so I gave a classic seminar in a physics department involving some various differential equations and things. Um, and then I went over to COP23, um, and, uh, so I, and I, was, I was in COP23 to participate in a couple of side events. But if you go to these events as an academic, um, they are rather bewildering, and I wasn't really that involved in the actual negotiations side. Well, I wasn't involved in negotiations at all. So uh, we're, we're hoping to hear from Salim as to what the progress was there. But I just thought, I, I, because we're here, because, as Rupert said, this was a a sort of the next stage from Paris, I thought it was, it was I make a couple of observations as an academic on the UNFCCC process, um, just sharing some thoughts of COPs I have been to. So I went to the uh, COP, I can't remember what number it was, uh, 2004 or 5 in Buenos Aires, where I gave a talk at a side event on the possibility of attributing harm to human influence on climate. So we, it was, and at that point, the side of it was being organised by a sort of bit of a fringe environmental group, and it was it was well attended. People were interested, but it was very speculative. See that? So that this was you know back in the mid two thousands. This was sort of slightly weird and radical stuff. Um, thanks in large part to Salim's efforts. Actually, that is no longer weird and radical stuff. Um, and loss and damage is now well uh, entrenched as part of the um, COP uh, negotiations, as part of the UNFCCC negotiations. So you often read articles by people expressing frustration at the slow progress of the, of the uh, I think we're going to have to turn that down a bit. Sorry, shall I talk quieter or we're going to be okay? Um, so you, you often read articles about people expressing frustration at the process. But it, it, so it is important to recognise, actually, it does, it does actually move quite fast compared to some other intergovernmental negotiations one can uh, think of. You know, notably one between Britain and Europe, which has been going on for a few months. <laughs> <laughs> um, for example, um, a gloomy example, but, uh, but you know, the, there's actually, you know, the, the progress does move on. The other example is that I was at the um, COP in Doha in 2012, I think it was. So only three years before Paris, and I was speaking at a side event there on the work we've done on cumulative carbon budgets and its implications for climate policy. The main implication, of course, being that um, the only way to actually stop climate change was to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, net carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere to zero. At that time, most of the people I spoke to at that COP were still in the 50% cut by 2050, that's what we're aiming for here, that's going to be enough. 
Um, and regarding this guy wandering around saying, no, actually it's zero, I almost felt like I was this sort of guy in, 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 in sackcloth and ashes out in the desert, you know, <laughs> some, some, some biblical figure who sent this tiny message. Um, three years later, three years, that was in the Paris Agreement. So the, the process, and, and that didn't have to be in the Paris Agreement. It was actually this sort of idea of contraction and convergence to two tons of CO2 per year, which was kind of the mantra back in, in, uh, in you know, pre-2010, I would say. It was quite a quite comfortable, politically comfortable way of framing the problem, because it meant that most of the world's population could increase their emissions, only a few would have to reduce them. And the only reason the process abandoned that model and agreed on net zero was because of the science. It wasn't because it was politically convenient for anybody, but it was convenient for any country to make that transition. But the process <coughs> did. So the process is responding to the science, and the process, that, you know, it, it's remarkable in that sense, um, in that the process is, is actually working to address the climate problem. Of course, it's frustrating, and I don't want to be able to share with us some of the frustrations. But I think it is important to step back a bit and, and really sort of Toast what they are doing. <coughs> this is a process where I think many countries, if one of them looking a little, one of those countries looking a little wobbly at the moment, but they'll, they'll, they'll get back in eventually, um, are, are getting together to address uh, one of the world's uh, most challenging problems. So I think, I'll, you know, that's that's the, the, the overarching reflection um, I'd like I'd like to give here. Um, in case anybody's wondering, the actual event I was speaking at there was on the sort of nitty gritty question of how much weight we give to methane compared to CO2, which is the kind of thing that really messes up uh, people at the conference um, and means very little to anybody outside it. Um, and uh, it was a very well attended side event. Um, lots, of, lots of metrics and nerds turned out. Um, but uh, but I, thought I, 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 I thought I wouldn't uh, share my experiences that side of it with you and have to sort of talk to people about methane afterwards if they're interested. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but that was my, what, what I wanted to share about my, my overall impression of the UNFCCC process, much of which has been driven by Celine. So that's the point after which I, I, I hand over to the main event. Okay. Thank you very much, Miles, and good evening, everybody. <coughs> so what I propose to do is to tell you a little bit about uh, myself and, and my role at the COPS at the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change and then a little bit about my impression of what happened in COP23. And then I think we'll have a chance for uh, question and answers later if anybody's interested in specifics. So I've, uh, I'm a climate scientist, not a real climate scientist like uh, Miles. I've been working on the impacts of climate change, uh, and particularly in vulnerable countries for a long time, and looking at how those countries and communities in those countries can adapt to the impacts of climate change. So the subject matter or the aspect of climate change that I work on is on adaptation. And then more recently on the issue of loss and damage, which is what happens when you fail to adapt and, and the losses actually happen, which is happening already. And in the UN Framework Convention process, every uh, year for two weeks we get together at this conference of parties. Uh, at that uh, event, I go as an observer, I'm not a negotiator, but I advise a group of countries called the least developed countries. There are 48 of the poorest countries in the world, most of them from sub-Saharan Africa, but a few in Asia, including the country I come from, Bangladesh. And they work and negotiate as a caucus group. The, the current chair of the group is Ethiopia. And I've been advising this group for many, many years now, ever since it started, on particularly the issue of adaptation, and now uh, more recently on loss and damage as that has gone up the agenda. So that's my specific area of interest. And going into COP23, um, given that you may, I'm, I'm sure, be aware by now, that even though it was held in Bonn in Germany, the presidency of COP23 was with Fiji. It was actually Asia Pacific's turn. These COPs are, and they move around continent by continent, and each continent gets a turn to host them. It was Asia Pacific's turn, and Fiji, uh, took the presidency, but since they didn't hold such a big meeting uh, in Fiji, the German government offered to host it for them. So even though we were in Bonn, Germany, it was Fiji's presidency, mm -hmm. and the Prime Minister of Fiji himself was the uh, president of the COP, and he had already declared a couple of interests, first of all, on the issue of loss and damage 
uh, from climate change, which for the island countries, particularly in the Pacific, is actually an existential threat. Some of those islands are going to disappear. It's not a if, it's when. Um, but more importantly, why it was important for this year's COP was the series of events that we've seen around the world in this year alone, 2017. In my part of the world, in South Asia, we had a one in a hundred year flood. In the Caribbean, we had a series of devastating hurricanes, one after the other, category four, five. Uh, not that hurricanes are unusual, but the severity of them was certainly unusual, and that was certainly due to elevated temperatures in the Caribbean and the Atlantic Ocean at that time, making them much more severe. So the, the loss and damage from these events is really not just because the events happen, but because they are much more uh, intense than they otherwise would be. And that's the fingerprint of human-induced climate change. And that's why the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change is important for assessing this loss and damage. So the issue of loss and damage was high on the agenda for uh, Fiji and for the other vulnerable countries, including Bangladesh and the East Developed Countries Group. Uh, going into the COP, we already have some degree of uh, agreement on this. And the 19th Conference of Parties in Warsaw all countries agreed to set up something called the Warsaw International Mechanism on loss and damage. So there's a place for it, there's an executive committee that discusses it. They came up with a five-year work program, which we adopted and, and endorsed in COP23. But there's one aspect of that that we wanted to push. We, we managed to push it a little bit, but not as much as we had hoped, which is how do we finance the compensation of loss and damage for the developed, vulnerable developing countries who are already facing these impacts. Uh, what the developed countries were willing to talk about is insurance. And insurance is a, is a means of uh, providing uh, compensation for victims after they've uh, uh, suffered loss and damage. We have nothing against insurance, but we have a problem with insurance being applied to the poorest and most vulnerable. They can't pay the premium, and if you pay the premium for them, then it ain't insurance anymore you might as well give them uh, the compensation directly. So we've been pushing for trying to come up with more innovative means of providing finance for uh, the most vulnerable who are suffering loss and damage. As I said, we didn't manage to get beyond insurance, but we do have on the agenda at the intersessional next year um, the possibility of continuing to discuss this. So we haven't forgotten it, uh, but we didn't get what we wanted. The, the major outcome of COP23, I would say, just to paraphrase, it, in, in, uh, as Miles said, there are big cops and there are small cops. The big cop was Paris. We had a, a major agreement in Paris two years ago. This was a relatively less important cop it was to discuss the modalities of implementing Paris and setting up next year's COP24, uh, which is going to be in, in uh, Katowice in Poland, where we're going to have a, an assessment, a stock taking of uh, where we are on the Paris Agreement. So what the Fijian presidency was able to do, and I thought this was quite an interesting innovation, they brought this concept of Talanoa dialogues, which evidently the Pacific Islanders used to come to consensus, which is not a, a adversarial negotiation like we have in the COP between countries, but a much more inclusive discussion where everybody gets a say and you arrive gently at a consensus on what needs to be done with everybody having had their say. And so they started this in, in COP23 in Bonn, and together with the Polish presidency, the Fijian presidency and the Polish presidency are going to spend the next 12 months, between now and COP24, when we go to Warsaw, uh, Katowice in Poland, talking to everybody, including not just governments, but non-governmental groups. Indigenous peoples groups were recognized. Uh, a, a gender action plan was adopted. So there were a number of uh, less earth-shattering, but nevertheless important issues adopted in COP23, particularly from Fiji's perspective, to try and open up this dialogue and discussion and hear from many different uh, uh, people who are involved in dealing with the issue of climate change so that their views can come into the, uh, the COP24 uh, next year uh, discussions on the stock taking of where we are on the Paris Agreement. Maybe I'll stop there and then uh, happy to take questions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much to Miles and Salim. Um, I will now hand over to both some students in the University of Oxford delegation um, and some other guests of ours here who have been to COP the last two weeks. Um, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves by name and um, where they come from. <coughs> um, 
moment or so um, to talk briefly about their experiences at COP. Hi everyone, uh, so my name is Sujay Nansen and uh, I'm currently doing my master's at Oxford on uh, env environmental change and management. Um, at COP23 I was actually working and studying with ICAT and focusing on loss and damage and also climate litigation, now kind of like looking to the area of loss and damage litigation and also with uh, Professor Benito Miller who is from Oxford with the Meets Developed Country Fund. My name is Megan, I am a master's student in Nature Society and Environmental Governance and I was at the COP doing some preliminary research for a dissertation potentially on media representation of Pacific Islands at this particular COP because it was the first time that a Pacific Island has had the presidency of the COP and so I spent my time going to island related events and talking to journalists who are covering the experience and it was really interesting to see from the inside how the Fijian presidency impacted the kinds of coverages that were being done of the COP. Thank you. Hi, my name is Frederick uh, Erickson. I am a master's student in the Environmental Change and Management Program here at Oxford. And at COP, I focus mainly on the role that youth play uh, in these negotiations and the, the avenues uh, that youth uh, use to impact the negotiations and, and essentially what goes on in and around the conference. Hi, I'm Kevin Subley. I'm also in the uh, Master's Program for Environmental Change and Management. Uh, for the past uh, probably six to eight years, I've worked in Washington, D.C. in international relations, so this kind of conference was exactly the kind of thing that I thrive on. And I, I attended mostly just to attend the conference, say that I've been to meet people, find out what's going on. But uh, I'm also concentrating in my research on the security, securitization of uh, natural resources and the extent to which that impacts uh, these types of negotiations and national security policy. <coughs> Hi, my name is Brisbane Mocheza. I'm a deep student with the geography, studying the impacts of climate change on biodiversity. Um, I traveled to COP with, uh, as part of the Oxford delegation, and my task was to assist with uh, the running of the side events that the university had there. Um, this was my first time I've been to a COP session. My experience of it is quite broad, but I'll just talk about my impression of, of this uh, COP. Um, my impression so far is that it, uh, the success that, that this COP has achieved in terms of uh, bringing to the surface the impact of climate change to humanity. As I was sitting in um, several side events, listening to the experiences and stories shared by communities and people who are already impacted by climate change, seeing pictures of the damages caused by climate change, I just got to realize that this issue is such a humanity mission. I, I got reminded that climate change is not just about the science, it's about people's lives being at risk here. You know, people's lives as they know it being transformed quickly before their eyes. Um, habitats being destroyed, you know, food security being compromised. As I was sitting there and listening and seeing all these pictures, a thought came into my head and I said, you know, one of the duties of this COP should be to raise ambition in the mitigation, adaptation and finance support for developing countries and those vulnerable states to climate change. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name's Sam Bickersteth, and I would love to be doing a master's degree at Oxford <laughs> University. I did one so long ago, um, they didn't teach anything about climate change at that time. But I'm an honorary research associate at ECI, and for the last seven years I've been leading CDK and the Climate Development Knowledge Network, and had the pleasure to work with both Salim and Miles during that period. So I too was <coughs> at Bonn, um, in Bonn, and it, Bonn actually had two zones for COP. It had the Buller zone, where the negotiators hung out, and it was deadly boring. And it had the Bond Zone, which was a lot more fun. The Buller Zone was boring, perhaps by necessity. Um, if you're going to have a, 
a Paris, you then have to make the rules to make it work. And there were long, fairly dull, unexciting, and unenergetic, low ambition conversations throughout the two weeks. I think a lot of people didn't really know why they were there, sitting, actually. Um, but they generated 266 pages of text, uh, which will keep them busy through a large number of intercessions through this next year. And one sense you could say that's necessary, but some old thoughts have come back that we saw move, we felt we'd moved on from in Paris. A lot of discussion about bifurcation. So them and us, the Annex 1 and non-Annex 1 countries, a number of countries really slowing the process down quite deliberately to, I think, the frustration of, of the groups that Celine and I work with. Um, over in the bomb zone, it was a lot more fun. Um, the US government tried to, the, the federal government tried to hijack an event uh, and put people in coal in the room and everyone turned their back and walked out and that was quite a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> Poor Mrs. Merkel had a bit of trouble too because we were reminded they got a trick from you, Miles. Actually, you used to take coal to lectures, didn't you? I've seen you with that. So a lot of people handing out coal to remind us that coal is being extracted, just new coal is being mined just 50 kilometres from where we were standing <coughs> in Bonn. Coal was a big issue. Canada and the UK now, with a high ambition coalition, is is leading with I think 19, 19 other countries a phase out of coal. So that's a very exciting development. It's now going to be led by a small island state, the Marshall Islands, are actually leading that initiative with a high ambition coalition. Um, science is embedded, as Miles said, in the negotiations, thank goodness, and I felt thank goodness to that, and I think that remains the case. But actually, it's really all about money. At the end of the day, the entire negotiation is about finance, and loss and damage is also about finance. Um, and there were some small advances. The adaptation fund is now the instrument of the convention, which is for the African states and the least developed nations. That's really important for embedding the principle of fair share of finance, but not just adaptation, which is a harder thing to finance, <coughs> and mitigation, which is where the large amount of finance continues to flow. Um, there were some really exciting um, private sector events. I've been working with a thing called the Climate Finance Accelerator, which is bringing the City of London together with countries to try and accelerate the speed at which the, the trillions that sit in London, you can think of the city as an enormous sort of bank with surplus cash, very low appetite for risk, and all the developing countries with their ambitions set out in Paris and the need for cash. And, and, and that process was really moving forward to a certain extent um, in, in, in Bonn, and I think that's encouraging. So across the board, whether it's land use, cities, infrastructure, uh, and energy, you see some movement. In fact, there's an agreement on agriculture for the first time after five years' struggle to come up with agreement. I think the other fun thing was the sub-national sub agenda uh, has moved forward very fast. Um, and you see governors and senators from the United States, they're all Democrat ones, sitting with um, regional and provincial mayors from Kenya and stuff. So you see this really mixture of North and South. There's no bifurcation there, actually. You've got sub-national actors, mayors, and sub-national leaders really saying we're going to lead this agenda. And I think that's something that just started in Paris but now has a massive momentum behind it. Um, but that's enough for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, now we open the floor up to questions, and if I could ask you to uh, wait for the roving mic to get to you, and then to introduce yourself for asking the question. Um, hopefully we will be able to discuss both um, the events of the last couple of weeks, um, but also um, where we stand in the UN climate process as a whole, and in achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement. And if you've got a question about greenhouse gas metrics, please just hold it. Laura Canuari, Kais, King's College and ECM alumni. Um, my question is for Simon. I'm sorry, um, I don't know how to frame it. But um, it really is about, as we see the evolution in the negotiations for loss and damage, and more financial mechanisms being mobilized to that side, how do we prevent um, local governments, urban planners, uh, disaster risk reduction, national agencies from losing their responsibility on ensuring that cities, communities are built uh, in a way that actually reduces the potential of a natural disaster? 
Um, I'm just thinking from an ethical standpoint, it's sort of withdrawing their need to really propose measures that increase the resilience of cities and communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. So, um, I don't think there's much fear of that. Uh, people on the ground who are already now facing impacts of climate change, and this is not just in the poor developing countries, even the developed countries. If you look at what happened in Houston just a few months ago, uh, they are still suffering the consequences of uh, Hurricane Harvey that not only came with the wind, it came with a huge amount of rainfall and devastated uh, the poorest parts of uh, Houston, the poorest communities living in, the, in, in Houston. So, uh, cities around the world, uh, local governments around the world are realizing that climate change is real and they need to take action and they need to make themselves more resilient. I don't think anybody is sitting back waiting for, let it happen and then I'm going to get money because it's happened. Nobody sits and waits for that. You don't burn down your house to get the insurance on the house. So, you, people are taking precautions already. There's inadequate funds to help them adapt and there's almost nothing for them once the um, events occur. So let me give you uh, the example of the Caribbean where we saw these three major hurricanes hit Harvey, hit Texas, Irma hit Florida, and then Maria hit, hit Puerto Rico. These three United States, two states and a, a territory, have already done their loss and damage assessment. It's well over $300 billion, and they've sent the bill to Congress, and Congress is debating it right now, and they'll get in the region of 100, 200 billion dollars from Congress. Loss and damage from climatic impacts. These are real. Nobody's questioning that. All they question is what causes it. At the same time, the twin island country of Antigua and Barbuda was also hit by Maria. And Barbuda, the smaller of the two islands, was completely devastated. Everybody who lived on Barbuda is now moved to Antigua, is living with friends and family, and when their houses are going to be rebuilt, they don't know. The United States government is not going to pay them anything. Where are they going to go with the bill for that? The United Nations, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, is the place where they should expect some kind of support. But unfortunately, we didn't get that. And if I could ask you just to speak so directly into the microphone. Okay. <laughs> Good night everyone, my name is Aria and I'm an ECM student here and I am from the Caribbean so I really appreciated your contribution. Now you noted that insurance is not the way and I know recently the Caribbean instituted this Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility which will not work. What sort of other adaptation strategies that you were maybe suggesting or you would have really wanted to explore during the COP event? <laughs> Well, the, the adaptation work uh, that we have to do is to be pre better prepared. These events are going to become more frequent and more uh, fierce in future. I come from uh, Bangladesh where we are investing a lot in trying to figure out what we can do and actually doing a lot of things uh, in Bangladesh. And I think all countries are going to have to do that. Um, the unfortunate fact is that even with the best adaptation, there are going to be events that we cannot prepare for and they will be. Uh, loss and damage after the fact. And we need to think about how we are going to deal with that. At the moment, we're really not doing very well. As I said, insurance seems to be the only solution offered by the developed countries. But we have to think beyond uh, um, uh, insurance. And my, my preference, uh, this is a personal preference, countries haven't agreed to this yet, is that we need to put a, a, a tax on pollution. So we need to make a polluter pay uh, principle applied particularly in the case of the fossil fuel companies, there's only a few dozen major fossil fuel international companies that are reaping billions, tens of billions of dollars in profits from taking fossil fuels out and having them burn and causing the problem. They are the ones causing the problem and profiting from causing the problem. To me, that is no longer acceptable. They need to be taxed. We need to impose a, a, a loss and damage levy on them. There's a civil society movement of uh, organizations, NGOs and others calling for this. Governments haven't accepted it yet, but I think we need to push governments to accept it. Hi. Um, so the last speaker to introduce myself uh, said that there are a few topics that came up at the COP 
uh, that we thought we moved past, that they came back up again. Um, I just wanted to bit, ask a bit more about what they were, why they came up, and maybe how we can move past them uh, more effectively. <laughs> Might need Salim to help answer that question. I mean, I think the, the principle of the Paris Agreement was that um, every country uh, has to respond, uh, and all countries put their NDCs, their nationally determined contributions, on the table. It wasn't just the, 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 the rich, polluting countries. Um, but I think this, this sense of bifurcation comes out, particularly in, in, the, in the finance debate, really, uh, and it's around the contributions there. The, the, the climate finance remains deeply frustrating for developed countries, as, as uh, your colleague from, from the Caribbean points out, effectively, that these other mechanisms are insufficient. Um, the new emerging economies play into that. Um, I'm not going to name them, but they play in the middle of that space. Um, the developed countries feel they put a lot of money on the table, the Green Climate Fund, the United Kingdom's put a lot of money in, the US has of course has withdrawn some of what it offered to put in, so that's pretty unhelpful. Uh, the German government uh, continued to put more money on the table for the adaptation fund, but these are tiny, tiny sums of money. Most climate finance comes from us, from the people who suffer, who have to rebuild their houses, or the national governments, uh, and that's where you need to identify money, but there is a great potential to shift it. So my sense is that some of that, that sort of coming together to achieve the outcome in Paris, we moved on to the nitty gritty of actually trying to make it happen and people fall back uh, around, around climate finance. Um, but the, the old arguments uh, of, 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 of polluter and non-polluter, historic non-polluter. There probably could be other examples. Salim, can you help me with other sure. old thought lines? <laughs> here, here? So, uh, pardon me. So, uh, let me rephrase it slightly from the way Sam presented it. In, in one of the things that we've been seeing over the many years that we've had the uh, annual conference of parties is a very strong north-south divide, a rich country, uh, less rich country divide. Paris, in a, in a very significant way, took us beyond that. It was a universal agreement, unlike the Kyoto Protocol, where we had that divide. Only the rich countries had to take action, the poorer countries didn't. In Paris, we all agreed to take action. It's a universal agreement. And, and hence, that should take us to this new era of everybody cooperating. But unfortunately, in the negotiations, in the official negotiations, this fault line continues to appear sometimes, and particularly when it comes to finance. But I would also argue that in a very significant way since Paris, last year in, in COP22 in Marrakesh, it started, and then this year in COP23, it really, I think, came to the fore that the difference between implementation of the Paris Agreement and negotiating the details of the Paris Agreement. So the negotiators who were sitting in the, the Bula zone that Sam mentioned with this you know, artificial light and no daylight, sitting behind closed doors negotiating commas and words, they require all 195 countries to agree before there's a decision. And in fact, after two weeks of negotiating, they were supposed to have finished last Friday evening. They went on all Friday night and only finished Saturday morning. Because that's the way they are. They, they just simply will not compromise at, at, at the beginning. They, they, they lock themselves into this very adversarial relationship. Whereas in the bond zone, where the rest of the uh, NGO civil society, governors of states and mayors of cities and CEOs of companies work, that's what I call now the implementer zone. They were doing things. They were announcing actions. And to do things, all you need is a coalition of the willing. You don't need 195 to agree. You just get a few people to agree, and you just do it. And I think one of the greatest um, opportunities that the Paris Agreement allows us is something that perhaps we didn't think about earlier. Its implementation doesn't depend on governments. And I think the US is a very good example. President Trump has officially withdrawn from the Paris Agreement. But it takes two years for a country to leave. It's like Brexit. He sent the letter in, but he's got two, two more years where they still is. So he sent a delegation. There was a State Department delegation in the, in the Bula Zone negotiating, doing the usual thing. Fairly low-level delegation, not doing very much. On the other hand, in the uh, other zone, the NGOs and, and companies had set up a pavilion 
where every day there were mayors coming and, and governors coming and CEOs coming and saying, we are still with the Paris Agreement and we are going to implement the Paris Agreement and we are with the rest of the world in doing this. And in fact, in the United States now, they are on track to meet the Obama promise, pledge, for reducing their emissions because the economy is moving away from coal into renewables in a very big way. And Mr. Trump, despite his efforts to promote coal, is unable to stop it happening. And to me, that's one of the greatest achievements of the Paris Agreement. By being a voluntary agreement, it allows everybody to take part in it. And all of us, all of you can be part of the solution now. You don't have to wait for to hear what came out of the COP and what countries agreed to. We have the Paris Agreement. Look at the bits of it that you like and then start implementing it. <laughs> issue of uh, climate finance. I was, uh, I had the opportunity to sit in one of the African group coordination meeting and one of the concerns or other frustrations was the complexity of accessing the, the, the climate uh, uh, fund. Yes, the funds are there, but so far they have not even managed to access even a dollar out of it because of all the um, challenges with be able to write proposals that meet up to uh, the requirements of accessing the fund. So it's, to us, it's like it hasn't done anything, and we're just we're, I'm, I'm just asking myself if this is going to change. Like, what's your take on that? Um, from you being part of the negotiations, I, I, I believe, uh, is there a chance of trying to make uh, the process of accessing fund by developing countries less complex? Sure, it's a very good question. In fact, as I mentioned, I, I advise the least developed countries in the negotiations and also on how to access climate finance, particularly for adaptation, which is the greater need for them rather than mitigation. And they all have this frustration. You, what you've described is universal. And my advice to them is persevere. Don't give up. The fund, it has its problems. It's a new fund. They're having problems putting their procedures in place. They've made them too complicated, which they realize, and we're hoping they'll make them less complicated now. Um, and you know, it's taking them time to get off the ground. This is the Green Climate Fund, which is the new big fund. In parallel, we have an existing fund called the Adaptation Fund, which is functioning already. And that's what we wanted to uh, keep moving forward. And fortunately, in Bonn, a number of countries, including Germany, put money into it. So there will be money for adaptation, and, and we, we do have the ability to access the Adaptation Fund because we've been doing it longer. The Green Climate Fund is a bigger challenge, but we hope it will get better. And we shouldn't give up uh, hope on it. We should persevere, uh, try and get the procedures to be made less onerous and complicated, because they are onerous and complicated. But at the same time, learn to put proposals together that will get through the, the various hoops that we have to jump through to get the money out. But eventually, I think we'll get it. So I, I'm, I'm optimistic. We need to keep uh, at it and not give up hope. But it is frustrating, and I accept that. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, you mentioned uh, quite a bit about you know the corporate contributions and NGOs and people who are kind of contributing because they want to rather than because like the governments have made um, these commitments. So what would you say that you had seen in terms of positive steps towards that from corporate side or NGOs and what, like, how important do you think that actually is in the grand scheme of things compared to, like you said, the governmental side, the more like, dull sitting and writing all of these agreements? Well, I, I think personally <laughs> the game changer is not getting a further agreement in, in the COP. The Paris Agreement was a game changer in itself, but you know, further agreements on that will be incrementally driving it forward. But the big game changer is a shift in global investments away from fossil fuels into renewable and sustainable energy that has to happen very, very rapidly. It's begun to happen. It's beginning already. Already you can see the cost of renewables uh, being better than coal, cheaper than coal. They will soon become cheaper than petroleum and then natural gas. Uh, you have electric vehicles now competing with internal combustion engines quite significantly. Um, and so that's really the, 
the technological shift that is going to be required to wean ourselves as a global community of nations and economies away from a fossil fuel based economy globally into a renewable energy based economy and that will be driven by investors and the businesses not by Copper agreements. Copper agreements can stimulate it, and, and the Paris Agreement is stimulating it. But the investors are the ones who want to do it. But and I distinguish between investor and the company. The coal companies are fighting us to the nail, and we have to fight them. But it's the investors <coughs> in the coal company that we have to convince that it's not a good investment to invest in coal. It's better investment to invest in renewable. And they're listening. They have already stopped investing in coal and they're investing in renewables, and the only way the coal industry survives is because their governments want them to survive. <laughs> Merkel has to make them survive in Germany, Trump tries to make them survive in the US, but their commercial viability is gone. So if you chip in on this, um, I'll just start to just about something on the stage. But I think one of, I think it's a great research project is why it was possible to get net zero into the Paris Agreement, by the way, if anybody's sort of thinking about research projects, I've not seen that paper written. Um, it's a, I mean, it's a social science paper, it's not something I would do, but I just find that, well, why is it possible to agree that? Um, and I think part of the reason was the realization that actually um, zero is actually, it, it's a useful number in that it doesn't really matter what units you measure it in. And there's not much point in arguing over how you divide it up. Um, so as long as we were talking about, you know, Two gigatons, to two, two, two tons of car CO2 per person per year, or something. Every company in the world could hope, well, that'll be my tons, it'll be my product that they're using. But when you get to the point of actually zero, suddenly you realize, okay, we're going to have to move on. At some point in the century, we're going to have to just move on from this whole fossil fuel economy. Um, and I think that realization is filtering through into boardrooms and into corporate thinking. Maybe we won't do it by 2050 or 2060, which is what we would need to really have a good chance of staying at 1.5. But you know, the thinking is there, and already, therefore, investing in assets that will be generating carbon in 50 or 60 years' time, and many companies have to make investments on those kind of timescales, is starting to look a slightly stupid thing to do. So I think it's that, it's that thinking that will ultimately turn you know, turn the ship around, but it's 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 going to take time, and it'll take a lot of you know <coughs> pressure from all sorts of different angles. So I don't know if here is involved in the investment <coughs> payments on. That's a great angle to keep pressure on companies. Um, there'll be people here going off and working in these companies as well. Or how do you do? You can press from within, you can press from without, and, and that's eventually how we're going to turn the thing around. Can I just add one thing to that? I mean, a number of you probably heard the acronym TCFD task force on climate-related financial disclosures of the G20 um, led by the, the Bank of England. It's a really significant uh, task force um, and the kind of work that goes on here at Martin's called about you know, post-carbon transitions are driven by the fact that it will move from being a voluntary to a regulated process. The French government is already obliging companies to report on their climate-related risks. Now, if you sit on as the big energy companies do. They're giant bankrupt companies sitting on infrastructure which they can't use. And the loss, if, if they actually valued that, their net worth would fall dramatically. So forward-thinking companies are, are, are adjusting this. I mean, I run an energy, but I see PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers, a major company that is advising corporates on responding to the SDGs, because that's kind of a, a broader agenda to which many companies uh, are engaging. And I think that's what will drive the speed of this. We're seeing this in electric vehicles, we're seeing this in renewables, we now need to see it in other sectors as well. Biodiversity Conservation and Management. Um, you mentioned just now about investment in fossil fuels. I was wondering how much conversation there was in regard to transparency when it comes to investment in fossil fuels. Not, be, not to be too political, but the Paradise Papers have revealed that they're in kind of a sticky situation in this university and many other big businesses are implemented as well. So how much was that talked about in terms of transparency and getting things that are currently legal 
talked about and making them potentially illegal to gain progress in this whole process. I think that's what Sam was talking about, the transparency initiative is for corporate. Yeah. It's definitely on the agenda. Action may take a little while. Um, just, just put a bit of a dampen on it. I mean, the, the, the task force of financial disclosure was, it, it's an industry-led initiative. You know, it's definitely sort of jollying people along, and uh, it probably wouldn't be as radical and transparent as you'd like it to be at the moment. And I think so, yeah, it's voluntary. I mean, so, so it's a voluntary participation. <coughs> um, so, but I think, that, as Sam said, it's sort of recognizing that that industry, the sort of financial management industry, has got to get its own house in order or it will have its house put in order for it. Like they'd, they'd rather make them all themselves. I think that's, that's the feeling. Um, but again, you know, anything to do with transparency, everybody can help because everybody can discover what's going on and learn about what's going on and, and start talking about it. Um, the question down front. So just speaking on, um, I guess, two points, two observations that I made. One of the activities that I did at COP in addition to attending the side events was speaking to a number of folks from industry and uh, the civil society and governments as, as much as I can. And at least um, having worked for a, a traditional blue chip company myself and then speaking to a number of people from the energy sector and, and uh, transportation sector, uh, I've noticed a trend um, and feel free to, to comment, uh, correct me, is um, okay, kind of away from providing direct you know, manufacturing something yourself or producing energy yourself and becoming more of a services related company. And I, I think that might be one of the trends that companies are, some of the more progressive companies are attempting to use to divest themselves uh, of responsibility um, when it comes to, to climate change impacts. And then secondly, I, just out of curiosity, how many Americans are here? Okay. Well, so just to just to put in context um, the much much covered event on coal that the Trump administration did. It, it, in reality, it was a relatively impotent event. To use a choice word. And then it was in a relatively small room. There were hundreds of these side events that occurred, and this was just it was listed alongside every other one. So it was just you know buried down there in the details. I think the vast majority of people who attended were press and protesters. I mean, the number of people who were there who actually thought that something interesting and relevant was going to come out of this was very minimal. Um, so it's, it was a bit of a sideshow, at least in my opinion. We, we have way more people that are interesting. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. So, so I just want to put that in context. They, they tried, but I don't think they got anything. They should have talked about global warming potentials. <laughs> Hi, I'm George from the Pink Stripe Shirt. Um, I, a question regarding the clean development mechanism. I um, understand it's going through some changes uh, when Paris is implemented post 2020. Uh, I wondered if you have any insights on how small undeveloped nations or LDCs are expecting or would like to see the CDM performed? I think most people have given up on the CDM now. <laughs> it's history. Uh, in fact, now there's talk of a new mechanism, a more broader sustainable development mechanism uh, being developed. The clean development mechanism, I think, has had its day. It, was, it required a Kyoto Protocol type cap to be set for the price of carbon emissions to be reasonably high. Um, but since the, the market's collapsed on that, it's really not going to happen anymore. So that's my view. I can speak a little bit on the compensation of non-economic loss and damage caused by climate change. <laughs> yeah, non-economic loss and damage is a major issue. Um, particularly for the small island states, as I mentioned, for them, um, 
islands like Tuvalu and Kiribati disappearing off the face of the earth, which is now inevitable. It's just a matter of how long they have before the seas overtop them. Um, it's something that we need to think about and we need to try and prevent as much as possible. So for me, the non-economic loss factor is a normative factor. Is as a civilization, are we prepared to lose a member state of the United Nations under the sea, or are we prepared to step up and prevent it from happening, which we can do by fulfilling the target of one and a half degrees uh, centigrade global, target, global goal? Uh, no amount of compensation is going to help them. You give them a million dollars each and uh, an apartment in, in Sydney, it's still not going to solve the problem. Uh, they want to stay on their island, they want to continue their life, and they have the right to do that. So we need to protect that right. One of, one of the most fascinating conversations I had Carl, was with a Fijian lawyer who, who was um, uh, actually uh, chairing one of the sessions I was, I was involved in. And uh, her particular interest was in what happens to exclusive economic zones when an island is artificially uh, innovative, when an island disappears. Um, and she was pointing out something I've never thought of. But of course, there's a relationship between this question and whether or not a country can acquire an exclusive economic zone by building an island. So most, most countries agree that you can't do that. Um, so obviously it's, bit, it's an issue in the South China Sea where there's all this controversy over these artificial islands there. Um, but if islands are artificially disappearing, what happens to the economic rights um, around that island? And uh, it's not something I thought of, but I thought, mm -hmm. yes, that will keep some lawyers busy for a while. Uh, thank you so much. I'm currently an MBA ECM alum. I have a question for the person who was involved in the youth engagement discussions. Um, I want to know what were the outcomes and what were some of the discussions there because I was at the New York Climate Week and UNICEF and UNCCC actually had both presidents of COP22 and 23 present there talking about youth engagement. But I particularly want to know what age groups were they focusing on, what is it, very young children, sort of young adults, and more of some of the potential policy regulations that came out of that, or some suggestions. What's on the um, Yeah, thanks for the question. So, the youth I spoke to, they're all my age, our age, um, college, just before, just after. Um, and youth are involved in, in the COP process, or in the process itself, or just outside, in, in several different ways. Um, and so there are re really four main ways that, that youth interact in the COP process. First of all, several countries have youth delegates, potentially all of them, I'm not sure, but, but several of them do. Um, and, and some country, that some countries, some country delegations actually do pay attention and listen to their youth delegates. Uh, the Netherlands have been held up as a, as a good example. Of this. So that's that's one way. These youth delegates then, in turn, will often listen to other youth in their country or, or activists or other interest groups that are there. Um, so that's that, that's one obvious way that youth interact with these negotiations and, and um, influence them by being actual delegates with sort of a party uh, access badge. Um, the second official capacity would be as part of um, other constituent groups of the COP negotiations. Um, so in addition to the countries that are parties to the agreement, um, there are other constituents. So this would be uh, Yango, ENGO, I think Rinko is the name. So these are um, non-state sort of um, uh, actors in, in, in this space. Uh, Yango are, is... Um, the space where youth NGOs uh, can come in and, and affect the process. ENGO is for environmental NGOs, uh, it goes for research, that would, that would be universities and, and, and academics. And, and they're not parties to the agreement, so they don't negotiate per se, but um, they partake in the negotiations and can, can do what's called interventions, um, which is basically a, a, a statement, um, a, a line in the debate, if you will. Uh, a comment uh, during these 
negotiations. They, they, from what I hear, I, I haven't been to the negotiations myself, so someone, someone should correct me if, if, if uh, I'm not 100% uh, correct. But, um, what happens is that these comments are, are often at the, at the end of the negotiations from what I hear, and often if you run over time, they'll get sort of pushed off the agenda entirely. So the, um, how effective these interventions are, I think, can vary, but, but that's, um, that's the second that's the second capacity in which you've used the involved and the other official capacity. Um, the, the third is as, as, as activists, the third or fourth is as activists. Uh, there were uh, demonstrations and, and actions taking place uh, outside of uh, COP, and the Gelände is a, a series of actions aimed primarily at, at coal mines in Germany, and, and that went on, I think, the week just before COP started. And so these are activists going into uh, these coal mines and shutting down operations by just placing placing their body in the way of, of these operations so that you can drive machines and, 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 and Run business as usual, uh, but there are also um, lots of uh, activists or civil society organizations, I should say, um, inside the space, NGOs, but mostly youth NGOs or young those. Um, and, and again, you can influence by just talking to people during the side events in bomb zone, or as part of Youngo, you can uh, influence what your Youngo representative says during these interventions. So that that's that's another big thing. Um, and then finally, the fourth way would just be uh, youth are there as researchers as well, sent um, by your, it was, as part of university delegations doing dissertation for for their doing research for the dissertations, or just being there and learning, um, but also sometimes leveraging their their university access to to support um, various activists and other youth organizations, which is uh, which is an opportunity that a lot of people uh, take advantage of. Um, I would say that, that um, I, I didn't get in, to be honest, I didn't even get into the Buddha zone at this COP, but I, 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 I felt, I still feel a little conscience stricken about this because I, I had one of the, you know, process to the Buddha zone badges, um, and I actually did try to swap it, but they refused to, to let me because it was also too late, um, and uh, uh, because, of, you know, there the wasn't, as you said, there wasn't much for me to do there. And another, um, at the, at the Doha COP, um, I did get into, and the Young Go's intervention was the only interesting thing I saw. And I think it was the only interesting thing everybody else did as well. So, I mean, and it was, you know, so, so that messages can get made that way. Um, and what I was interested in was everybody did stop their gossiping or their, you know, me fiddling with their mobile phones or whatever, and they did stop and listen because it was interesting. Um, and so I think that was, I don't know, for me that was more, maybe it was by contrast to the excruciatingly boring thing which had been going on before, which was really incredibly boring, uh, so that, that helped it. But, but, uh, but I think that's, that's worth noting, is that, is that it is a way in which sort of new ideas get injected into the process, where people get fed up with arguing over semi mm. And j Just very briefly, one of the ideas that was pushed in these interventions is the idea of um, uh, Problematizing conflict of, of interest and various organizations, mainly fossil fuel companies, who also attend COP uh, with their own agenda and trying to push those special interests to the side. This was an idea that was brought up in intervention by a number of so Yango and then ENGO and I think the, the gender uh, group as well, uh, along with one or two uh, country delegations. I, I believe uh, Switzerland uh, brought this up as well. So th these 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 constituents banding together to, to push an agenda that, that they believe in. Stay in front of the Yeah, I reckon this is uh, quite a broad question. We talked a, bit, a lot about loss and damage to life, about adaptation and about particular parts of negotiation and how individual actors are doing good or bad things. Um, if you kind of take the bigger picture, we agreed on a, on a goal, probably not a goal, but a, a ceiling really in Paris. And we also have a lot of research that tells us that we probably won't get to this ceiling with the current policies, the current pledges made by the countries. Um, so how do you think, um, how optimistic should we be and um, which measures should be taken not only till 2020 but also afterwards to make sure that, for example, loss and damage hopefully won't be as important a topic in the future as it probably will be in the current count? Well, that, that's a, a, a good question and a difficult question because we know that despite all the pledges that have been made, we are still headed for well over three degrees. Nowhere near two, nowhere near one and a half. So the question is, um, how feasible is it to get down that path? I think 
feasible on two counts. Firstly, uh, there is political will being generated, and I think that was one of the outcomes of uh, the COP23. And secondly, there is action on the ground happening, and I'll speak particularly about two of the major developing country economies, China and India. It used to be that China and India were sitting on a lot of cheap coal, they sort of felt that they were being asked to forego the use of that coal, and hence they were very against taking uh, uh, measures to reduce emissions or exempting themselves as they did in the Kyoto Protocol. That has changed completely now. But China and India, particularly China, sees the future in renewables and is investing heavily in that. Uh, so is India, uh, by the way. So uh, the reason for us having some optimism is that countries will do it in their own interests, not because there's an imposed agreement from above, from the international level. And that, in a, in a very real sense, is also Mr. Trump's misunderstanding of what Paris Agreement is. Paris Agreement gives the United States full autonomy to decide what it wants. I don't know why he thinks it's some kind of an imposition on uh, the U.S. citizen. Every country can decide for itself how much it's going to do. And the collective needs to add up to getting us to well below two degrees. But it will come from national interests rather than from everybody becoming altruistic and, and saving the world. Well, one thing I, I was doing there was pushing uh, the idea that uh, we should incorporate science much more um, deeply into the stop take process. Um, at the moment, um, the model that many people in the UNFCCC process, um, process seems to have is um, the, the idea that, that every seven years or so, the IPCC will do a sort of you know, re-evaluation of how we're going. Um, the analogy I was able to use, in a time was a reasonably effective one in our side events, was that would be a bit like the exercise machine in the hotel. You, you always have to use the exercise machine in the hotel for these things because you know, there's no other way of even getting any air. So it's now just the exercise machine in the hotel only telling you every five minutes how you're doing and otherwise being right. And well, speaking for myself, I certainly wouldn't exercise very hard if that was what the machine was doing. Um, so we need a process of continuously informing the UNFCCC process about how the commitments are aligning <coughs> with the actual progress of global temperatures. Um, and this is one of the sort of key things we were plugging there. Um, Oxford's uh, BB published a paper on the Monday of the second week of COP, um, uh, pushing the I, I, you know, proposing uh, an index of human induced warming um, that we think could be announced every year by the WMO or some institution like that, along with last year's global temperature. I mean, last year's global temperature goes up and down for all sorts of reasons. Um, what we really need to know is what is human induced warming doing. Uh, <coughs> The impact is going up faster than ever. So, despite sort of, you know, very, if you, if you actually look at the, the current rate of human induced warming, is, is, is at its fastest that it's ever been, uh, which is not good news. Um, this is despite a temporary slowdown in CO2 emissions over the past few years, which has in fact now appeared to have gone back to rising again. So, um, really, this is something that the science, science could contribute to the process, because one of, one of the other things coming out of Paris was this. Acknowledgement that we have been agreed to start with. Sorry, I'm not addressing whoever else asked the question. I completely forgot who it was. Um, anyway, oh, that was a good question. Uh, so, so one of the things came out of Paris was this acknowledgement that our short-term commitments aren't enough, and that we will therefore have a continuous stock-take process to update ambition and, and keep that aligned with the long-term temperature goal. And so, that process is still in flux. We haven't decided how it's going to work yet. Um, and we're very keen that that should somehow anchor these, the, the, the progress of ambition towards how we're doing towards the temperature goal. Because, by the way, I think it can be done, 1.5. Um, it can't be guaranteed, but there's a huge difference between something being, you know, 50, you, you probably get a 50 50 odds of 1.5 with the kind of mitigation options we've got available to us now. That would, you, you, couldn't give it, you couldn't give yourself, you know, 90% odds of staying below 1.5. Uh, but to suggest that uh, it's completely out of sight under, under all circumstances, I think it's, it's being a little bit uh, too, 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 too gloomy at the moment. It, it's receding, I'm afraid, but it's, uh, it's not out of sight. Can I just also add quickly on that note, uh, Miles? I mentioned that the negotiation.
negotiations went into overtime into the late night on Friday. One of the issues was the word science base which we pushed for and we got it. And you got it, well done, thank you. <laughs> Keeps me in <your> job. <laughs> um, we've got a question right in the far corner. Hi, thank you. Um, so most of the, well, generally almost all um, of the pathways for keeping global temperature rise under 1.5 degrees assume the role of negative emissions technologies. Um, there's not a lot of media coverage of this and there's not a lot of public recognition of that fact. But I'm wondering for those of you who have been to consecutive COP talks, how you've seen that conversation around those sorts of technologies evolve? and if there is a fear that developing these technologies will in fact you know, allow some nations or governments to sort of slack off in their commitments, if that is a fear or that just... Well, speaking for myself, I don't follow these uh, that closely, but my impression is that <coughs> it's certainly something that is being talked about on the fringes more than in the uh, real negotiations, but certainly people are bringing it up and coming up with ideas of what can be done. I personally really don't know enough about it to judge whether it's, it's good or bad. My opinion on that. Well, I was at two um, fringe dinners um, which were on this topic uh, at the top. Um, and so it, it's definitely acknowledged as an increasingly urgent issue and the huge mismatch between our investment <coughs> in an ability to dispose of CO2. Uh, I prefer to sort of keep it general like that rather than you know, exactly where the CO2 comes from. We are going to have to get rid of an awful lot of CO2 generated this um, century without dumping into the atmosphere. There's, there's almost no question of that. Um, uh, the need relative to the investment in an ability to do that um, is, is completely disproportionate. Um, and both of these dinners are about what are we going to do about that. Um, various things were suggested, none of which um, I found particularly reassuring, apart from one full-word comment by somebody who I can't name late in the room, who just said gently as he was wandering out, pulling on his coat to me, don't worry, China will do it. Go for the losing control. We have a comment on the front. So just to back on that, I went to the one in Paris as well, and then also went to the intersessionals in Bonn last year as well. And uh, the role of technology, especially carbon capture technology, I, as someone who's just an observer um, in the negotiations, I kind of felt like it's been less talked about, um, especially in terms of side events that you have on that as well. Like it's not as prevalent, especially at this COP23. We were actually talking about it with someone else, and I was just like, yeah, the role of carbon capture technology just hasn't really made much of an appearance or in terms of like side events that you could go to talking about this was not something that I really observed. It just seems like people are slowly moving away from it and trying to like adapt to other stuff. Um, I don't know. Like that's kind of my general observation anyway. And um, just to add to that, I think Um, so, I'm an undergrad doing PPE, and I'm more considering the political side. Um, how do you think that China and Russia have done in these negotiations? Have they taken up a bigger role, especially with the US kind of taking more of a backseat? Um, so yeah, just your general thoughts on China and Russia. In the climate change negotiations, climate, uh, China and Russia have very different roles. Uh, Russia has tended to be uh, a bit more of a recalcitrant in terms of taking actions. Uh, but China has really stepped up in a very big way, particularly since the US has decided to withdraw. Uh, China as the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases now is stepping up, uh, as I said earlier, in a very big way to change its own economy uh, from a fossil fuel based one to a renewable energy one. But also it's uh, putting a lot of effort in general diplomacy and coalitions with other countries. Um, it's put in about $3 billion of uh, climate change support, South-South support to developing countries. 
uh, to tackle climate change as well. So China uh, is, is definitely stepping up in a big way. Russia, not so much. <laughs> Although if I might, because no country, no country is completely monolithic, even a country as organized as China. And so there are Chinese companies still happily selling coal fire plantations to Africa. Um, you know, so there are always contradictions in every country. Uh, we have one final question from <laughs> The gentleman in the front Hello. Um, how did you travel to Germany? Is that a relevant question? And what does implementing Paris look like for us as individuals? Stop mm charging. -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll start with that one. Um, yeah, I had to fly. Um, I had to fly because I had to get back in time for lectures at the ECM program. Um, um, I went by train to Paris, um, um, although I did go by train to Paris twice, which I think probably worked. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, I don't, as I, I've published many times, say, as long as we make this, as long as this remains a personal, but our government, as any other governments, would love to make this an issue of uh, personal responsibility for consumers. It ain't. People don't have options to adopt a carbon neutral. If, if, I, if there was a if there was a pump available at a fuel station that would allow me to fill my car or indeed buy my plane ticket with um, fossil fuels for which the corresponding amount of CO2 would have been subject to state of so those fossil fuels were not causing climate change, I would have no problem paying the premium. Um, but that option is not given to me. Um, and, and by the way, the premium would be way less than the taxes I've paid, which is supposed to solve the problem of climate change. So it's my little political rounds here. Um, so um, we, we don't really just, we don't join these things up. Um, and uh, that's why many consumers find themselves kind of stuck on this one. And also understandably frustrated that they have the finger pointed at them um, as being to blame for the problem. Uh, when they don't really feel they have any options. And I think that's part of the big backlash we see, both in this country and in the US, against climate policy, is that people feel they're being blamed for something they don't have any control over. I'm sure there are other views. I mean, people are here. We've got other ways of judging why we're going to be here. Right. So let me, let me uh, tackle that and pick up on what Miles said. I also flew and uh, fly a lot. So. Uh, I'm extremely guilty of uh, having a very large carbon footprint. But what, one of the things that I feel um, all of us as, as conscious uh, consumers uh, can think about doing, uh, in addition to trying to reduce our own uh, carbon footprints, but not recognizing that it's not going to be possible to do that very easily, is to think about taking responsibility for the pollution that we cause. And the uh, emissions of greenhouse gases that we are personally responsible for are going into the atmosphere. This is not a victimless pollution. There are people on the other side of the planet who are being affected by the emissions that you and I are responsible for. And if we accept that as a responsibility, then I think another element follows, which is we need to think about what can we do about it. And I want to offer you a solution. The solution is you need to think about those people, and a lot of them are my neighbors in Bangladesh. And if you want to connect with them and know about them, and find ways to help solve the global problem in solidarity with them, then by all means get in touch with me and I'll put you in touch with them. So to me, the solution is global solidarity between citizens from both North and South and rich and poor. Not giving money. I don't want your money. I want your attention and your, ability, your willingness to engage with people on a human level and figuring out with them, getting to know them, figuring out with them, how can we tackle this global problem together? You in your part of the world, me in my part of the world. Because it is a global problem, and all of us need to step up and tackle it. If I could send very briefly, before I thank both our guests, I think Certainly my emotions, both when I was at COP last week and this evening, <coughs> is that this is a process which 
is often very frustrating, but at the same time deeply motivating, deeply inspiring, because these goals, as both our speakers said, they are not out of reach. Indeed, we must achieve them. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for coming in such large numbers this evening. I believe this is the largest number of people ever to attend an Oxford Climate Society event, which we're delighted about. But especially, I'd like to thank Miles and Celine um, for sharing their wonderful thoughts with us this evening.